Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church, where we love God, love neighbors, and live with purpose. Whether you are worshiping with us in the sanctuary or online, please know that your presence is a blessing this morning. Plenty of announcements. There's a lot going on in this church right now. First announcement, because Marty will kill me if I forget to say it. You have white index cards on the pews. If you would please put your name, contact information on that, and you can either drop it in the offering plate as you exit, or you can leave it there on the pew and we'll pick it up for you. Just a way of us knowing who is here in case we need to report to back to you that uh, anything. So if you would please fill out those cards. Sandra is out on vacation the last half of this month, but I think she's back in on Tuesday, uh, which is just in time for me to begin my vacation. I will be gone for two weeks starting uh, September 1st, returning back to the office on the 16th. Condolences to the family and friends of John Detello. John passed away Wednesday evening. Uh, he had been under hospice care for some time. Uh, services for him are pending at this point. I want to welcome new staff members this week. You know, Taylor um, left us as the director of communications, and uh, she's still going to be around as a, a participant in things here, but she just needed more free time to take care of her new little baby. And, but we have two new individuals to help us with what she was doing. Uh, our director of communications, the person who will be taking over the desktop publishing and the uh, emails and newsletters and all that stuff, uh, is Carrie Reardon, and she started this week. And then Sean Zeers will be taking over all of the videography responsibilities that Taylor was doing. So things like the midweek message, we're live streaming this morning and it will be uploaded for viewing later and edited and shortened uh, for the WIBW broadcast. So Sean's back there uh, in the sound booth this morning. So wave, Sean. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to have really two top-notch profession professionals helping us in this ministry. There will be a congregational meeting on September the 20th, the nominating committee will be uh, nominating Walt Menninger uh, to the class of 2023. The meeting will be held at 1115 right here in the sanctuary. There is a arts and crafts group that's coming up, and I wanted to put a plug in for it. This is what you will be making in that small group. It's a mosaic, and... You do get to pick some colors uh, and, uh, and shapes and so forth. So there are still some openings for that, I believe. And there's, there's more information in your uh, bulletin about when and, and the timing. But if you, if you have an interest in the arts, we're getting a small group started that's going to do a lot of different things. But this is the first project. So if you want to do that, let's uh, get you signed up for that. Just call Lori at the office uh, to get signed up for that. Blessing box needs, they're listed in the insert of your bulletin. So if you, uh, if you can help out with that, that would be wonderful. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Here in this place, there are no foreigners, for all are welcome in God's house. Here in this worship, there is only acceptance, for love is the language of faith. Here in our lives, there are no divisions, for God dwells in each of us. Come, let us worship in unity and love.
our sins to God, from whom our help comes. Lord, you alone are our God, our hope and help. But we do not always find it easy to love you with all our being. Our hearts, our minds, our strength do not always seek what is worthy of our trust and hope. Nor do we always find it easy to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. When we find ourselves far from your kingdom, draw us near. Forgive us when we fail, and bring us home to you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Beloved, the Lord is loving, merciful, and just. Therefore, we are forgiven. We are reconciled to God and to one another, that we might walk in peace and love. Good morning, young disciples, here and out there. I have the coolest substance on the face of the earth, super glue. Super glue is the greatest substance ever developed. You take one drop of this and you put two popsicle sticks together with it and nothing Nothing will separate them. They are stuck. And that's the way it is with super glue. That's why you can't get it on your fingers, because if you accidentally get it on your fingers, guess what? You can't get your fingers apart. So no matter what, through the thick and thin, super glue always sticks things together. It's a lot like that with true friendships, you know. We're going to hear here in a little bit a story about Ruth and Naomi. And the one thing you can remember about that story is that they were true friends. They were stuck together through thick and thin. Nothing but death would ever separate them. And that's the way it is with true friendships. And that's why we can be thankful to God for the friends in our lives, the people who, when we argue with them, when we fight with them, when times are really good and when times are not so good, they say to you, you are still my friend. So this week, I want us to work on being the kind of friend that always sticks together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the friends in our lives, those people who are there to help us when times are not so good. 
and those people who are there for you to help bring goodness into our lives. Help us to always be that kind of friend. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, you are our God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, teach us through your word to follow after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Listen for the word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any questions. Well, if you haven't noticed, I'm still stuck in the Old Testament. We finished our sermon series covering the lectionary stories in the book of Genesis a couple of weeks ago, but I'm not ready to let go of those Old Testament stories yet. So while we're in between sermon series, I'm going to talk about another one this morning, one of my favorite all-time favorite stories in the Bible, the story of Ruth and Naomi. I love this story in part because of the resourcefulness and the strength and the shrewdness and the commitment that these two women demonstrate. And, and that is reflective uh, of a lot of the Women who have been in my inner circle throughout my life, those same, those same qualities. Mostly I love this story because it exemplifies true friendship and what it can mean to our lives. In this story, we see a friend give to another and ultimately receive back more than they give. It's an unbreakable friendship where one person says, where you die, I will die. And that's, that is strong stuff that exemplifies true friendship. Well, let's, uh, let's get to the scripture, shall we? I'm going to be reading from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. So let us listen for the word of God. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephorites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech died. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Oprah, and the name of the other Ruth. 
When they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Do you do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud. Again, Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Naomi and Elimelech are living in the town of Bethlehem, and they are living a blessed life. By today's standards, they would be considered upper class. Life is good for Naomi, whose very name means my joy. Then life changed. Bethlehem, their homeland, gets crushed by a horrible famine. So Elimelech moves the family to Moab, where he can earn a living. Moab is an entirely different kingdom, uh, located east of Bethlehem in what is now uh, modern-day Jordan. In Moab, life for Naomi and Elimelech gets better. The good life returns, and Naomi once again finds the joy in her life to which her name ascribes. Then tragedy happens. Elimelech dies Naomi has lost her husband, and with his death go all of their hopes and dreams. And living in a male-dominated culture, in the throes of her grief, Naomi comes face to face with the reality that she no longer has a husband to care for her. Still, all is not lost. She, she has two sons, Malin and um, Chilean, who can care for her, and they do. Her two sons eventually marry, each a woman who was native to Moab. These wives were not Jewish and would be considered foreigners from those living inside the nation of Israel. But living in Moab, Moabite women were most predominant, so it makes sense that they would marry a Moabite woman. And for the next 10 years, Naomi resumes a relatively normal life. The joy reflected in her name once again returns. 
And then the absolute worst happens. Both Malin and Chilean are killed. All of Naomi's protectors are now gone, and she is left with absolutely nothing. And Naomi faces a heartbreaking situation. She has to make a plan for her future. So she decides to return to Bethlehem in the hope that some of her family living back in her homeland will be able to care for her. So she and her two daughters-in-law begin a journey back to the land of Judah. But along the way, Naomi turns to her daughters and says, Return to your homeland of Moab. She sends them back with the idea that they might find Moabite men to marry who will take care of them. At first, the two women resist, but Naomi persists telling them, Why would you come? Am I going to marry another man and have children that you could then marry? With these words, Oprah bids Naomi a heartbreaking and tearful farewell and heads back to Moab. But Ruth refuses to leave. She says to Naomi, I will not go. And she uses Words that resonate deeply her resolve to never, ever leave Naomi. She says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Do you get the sense of high drama in this picture here? Ruth pledges her absolute love and friendship and support to Naomi. Ruth is the embodiment of love and friendship. Ruth is leaving behind everything. She's leaving behind the only world she's ever known, to enter Naomi's world. She's giving up her family, her country, and her chance at the future. She's giving it up because Naomi's welfare is that important to her. And did you notice that Ruth not only pledges to become part of Naomi's family, She pledges that Naomi's God will be her God. For Ruth, turning back to Moab would have meant turning away from the God of Abraham and going back to the worship of idols in Moab. And I wonder, what was it that Ruth saw in Naomi that would compel her to make such a pledge? Was it the depth of Naomi's love that helped Ruth see God? Was it Naomi's gentleness or her kindness which drew her in closer to God? It was probably a little bit of all of that. And what does that say about what people today see in us that might draw them closer to God? And as we consider evangelism in the church during these times, we might ask ourselves when others look at us, do they see God and are they drawn closer in? Ruth and Naomi travel to Bethlehem and there is great excitement when they arrive. People remember Naomi, but they remember the Naomi who left full of joy. The Naomi who has returned is broken and bitter over her life. And so bitter is she that she changes her name. No longer call me Naomi, she says. Call me Mara, for my life has become filled with bitterness. Now at this point, that's 
pretty much where we stopped our reading for this morning. And if the story ended right there, this would just be a tragic story. But it's far from over. Because God has a plan for these two women. Ruth and Naomi, they launch into making a life for themselves. They had arrived to Bethlehem during the barley harvest. And in biblical times, there were certain society protocols that provided for those who were poor and needy. So, for example, farmers were expected to leave the outer edges of their field intact so that the poor could come and harvest and have something to eat. Well, Ruth is too old. Excuse me. Naomi is too old to work in the field. So Ruth, formerly a woman of wealth, becomes part of the working poor and going into the fields to harvest barley. Well, it just so happens that Ruth ended up harvesting from a field belonging to Boaz, a kind man who just happens to be a close relative of Naomi's. And Boaz shows great kindness to Ruth. And Ruth returns home that day with an abundance of grain. Now, at this point in the story, I have to stop and ask the question, do you suppose Naomi was shrewd enough to know that this particular field belonged to Boaz, her young, well-to-do, kind, and available relative? And do you suppose she had an inkling that Boaz might be interested in Ruth? Hmm. Seems plausible, doesn't it? When Naomi hears about Boaz, she gets an idea. She takes it on herself to find Ruth a husband. She plays matchmaker. Naomi coaches Ruth, telling her, put on some perfume and put on your finest clothes. And she sends Ruth back out to find Boaz and tells her how to get the attention of this kind gentleman. She tells Ruth, we can't leave such things up to the man or you're never going to get married. You do what I tell you. I'll show you how to catch a good man. Well, it turns out Naomi does know a thing or two about catching a good man. Because her strategy works perfectly. Ruth and Boaz fall in love. They get married. And they have a baby named Obed. Ruth gives Naomi a grandson who will care for her in her old age. Once again, Naomi's joy is restored. She takes baby Obed in her arms and cares for him, becoming his nurse. The book of Ruth concludes by sharing the lineage of Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who was the father of David, the greatest king in the history of Israel. And if you trace that lineage forward, generation after generation after generation, you get to Jesus. Ruth's name is in the messianic line of Jesus Christ. I mean, is this a great story or what? How incredible is it that God would select a poor Moabite woman a foreigner in the land of Judah to give birth to the ancestry of Jesus Christ. But when you think about it, isn't that just like the nature of God to use the plain and the ordinary to bring about something extraordinary? 
This story speaks volumes to us in these times. First, this story tells us that in the worst of circumstances, there is hope. Naomi is in a foreign country. Her husband has died, her sons have died, and she is left with absolutely nothing. And yet, from the pit of her suffering, God pulled a joyous miracle that brought to the world King David and Jesus Christ. This story tells us how God will use our friends to sustain us through difficult times. Ruth was an answer to Naomi's prayers. And Naomi became an answer to Ruth's prayers. And is it possible right now that God might be calling you to be the answer to someone's prayer? And are you watching for the opportunity to be that answer? Lastly, this story, we see the character of of a true friend, the kind of friend who is willing to sacrifice themselves and say to the other, where you go, I will go, and where you die, I will die. Ruth is that kind of friend, a friend who demonstrates the unwavering loyalty of a true friend and the love and the kindness of a friend. And in all of that, God creates this bond between these two friends so strong that nothing but death can separate it. Unwavering loyalty. Ruth and Naomi are examples of true friendship. Two people different needs, both praying, both giving, both receiving. And in the midst of all of that, God brings forth a king and a Messiah. Thanks be to God. Our neighbors are young and old, from here and there, friends and strangers, Christian and non-believers. Our neighbor is the one we do not abandon, the one we refuse to be separated from, the one we love as God loves. So let us give that our neighbor may know God's love through our love. There are a number of ways you can give to the mission and ministry of First Presbyterian Church. If you're here worshiping with us, as you leave, there will be offering plates at both doors, and you can place your offering in, in that. Uh, if you are watching online, you can go to donate.fpctopeka.org, and you can donate in that way. Or you can... Uh, simply mail your donation to the church office. In any event, your giving is important to the ministry of this church and very much appreciated. Let us pray. Bless these gifts, O Lord, from your unfailing care for your people. Let them be a sign of our gladness for all that we have and all that we may offer to others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.
It was Jesus who said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Believing in Christ who sustains us and satisfy our every need, let us pray for the church and the world. We pray. God of the covenant, we come to you today in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come in need of your blessing. You call us to sacrifice for others, yet often we don't hear you. You call us to be the answer to someone's prayer, yet often we fail to answer that call. Our preoccupation with our own lives blurs us and blurs your vision from us, and we fail to be witnesses of your kingdom on earth. Forgive us when we lack vision. Touch our hearts and teach us. Help us to give of our hearts so others will find joy and peace in your kingdom. God of love, we ask your help in those times in our lives when difficulty comes. Give us courageous and resolute hearts to face difficult situations with confidence. Provide us with your wisdom and give us patience when answers to our prayers seem far away. Help us to use these challenges to grow and learn. God of healing, we offer our prayers for those who are in need of your healing touch. Especially we pray for friends and family listed on our prayer list. And mentioned in worship this morning, we pray for those who have gone unmentioned, but whom are in our hearts. Lord, please hear our prayers on behalf of these loved ones. We ask that you see each of them and attend to their needs. God of light, we pray for those who live with darkness. We pray that the light of your truth in your word will be the lamp unto our lives and the light unto our path. Please provide us with the direction and guidance needed to find our way, answer our prayers in special and very definite ways. Lord of all, we hold up to you the needs of the world and ask that you touch the hearts of the leaders of our country and our world, inspiring them ways to work together for peace. Lord, we pray for your church and its leaders 
We pray that we may become more and more a means of grace, peace, and justice in the world. Please cover us with your love that we may confidently go forth from this place to be Christ in the world. We pray that in this ministry, you will bless us richly to your service. These things we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as you forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus gave us the great gift of the commandment, which is part of our mission statement. Go, loving God with all your being, and love one another and your neighbor and the world. May the Lord continue to watch over us, keeping us close. In the name of our Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.